Wix Studio, one end-to-end -end web creation platform for your agency to deliver exceptional work with absolute efficiency. The number one long-form writer that helps SEOs outrank competition at the click of a button using real-time research and NLP. Start ranking content today with contentatscale.ai. So, my name is Ryan Broderick, and yeah, I write a newsletter called Garbage Day, and I'm here to talk to you about memes in the age of generative AI. This is uh, four images that I generated. Um, this is me right now. Uh, this is also a cool test I use to try out different AI tools. I call it the Minion Test, and it's to see if it allows me to generate copyrighted content. It can't do Mickey Mouse, but it can do a Minion. So, I write a newsletter called Garbage Day, and I cover four main areas online platforms, internet drama, memes and trends, and emerging tech. And emerging tech is what I'll be talking about today, specifically the world of AI. So a couple weeks ago, a company uh, ingested all of my newsletter into its product and made a chatbot out of it. I did not give them permission to do that, but I thought it would be uh, interesting to use it to break the ice. So I asked it for a good joke, and it said, uh, why don't SEO experts celebrate Christmas? because they don't like the idea of Google knowing if they've been naughty or nice. And then I'm supposed to pause for laughter, so please laugh. <laughs> Great, thank you very much, thank you. Um, so how many people here have used any sort of AI before? Round of applause. Okay, now keep applauding if you use it secretly at your job. Okay, yeah, good, that's what I thought. So <laughs> this is the newest version of OpenAI's ChatGPT. It runs on GPT-4, and it has plugins which are different services it can interact with. So as an experiment, a couple months ago, I used GPT-4 and a plugin for a grocery delivery service called Instacart to generate uh, seven days worth of meals, an ingredients list for those meals and instructions, and then I had them ordered to my house. It was really interesting. In under two hours, an AI had planned out my entire week of meals. I don't know if I would have ordered smoked turnips but they did go very well with the tofu, which I was surprised about. Um, so let me give you kind of a broad overview before we get deeper into this world. Uh, so we have four main AI services right now. We have Microsoft's Bing, which runs on OpenAI's GPT-4 and GPT-3.5. We have Google's Bard, which is not good. <laughs> and we also have ChatGPT, which kind of works in the same way, although it cannot access the public internet. It has a knowledge cutoff of 2021. And we also have Meta's Llama 2. It was, Llama 1 was not very interesting. Llama 2 is very interesting, and they are currently open sourcing it, so you can kind of play around with it yourself. I did an experiment last year where I had ChatGPT write a part of my newsletter for me. I asked it to uh, create a new meme. Uh, it scared me a little bit. <laughs> it created a meme called, I'm a robot, but I still feel like a human. Uh-oh. <laughs> Uh, and it then wrote up a summary of how the meme went viral. It's not very good. In fact, my eyes kind of glaze over every time I try to read this, but I do think it's interesting that it knew enough about how the internet culture works that it said that it went from 4chan to then places like Reddit and Tumblr, which is kind of how memes operate. Chances are, though, you all probably started seeing AI via these little images last summer. This is a Dolly Mini. This was sort of like the early test version of OpenAI's visual generator Dolly. This is Cookie Monster Death Metal album cover. Pretty good. Um, obviously, AI has progressed quite a bit in the last year. Uh, I remember this, this kind of went viral, and I was like, wow, that's, that's pretty good. And now I'm, I'm terrified every day. Um, in terms of the visual generators for AI, we have three main ones. We have Midjourney, which runs on Discord. Uh, you basically talk to it like a Discord user. Discord is a, is a messaging platform like Slack, but for gamers and me. And we also have OpenAI's Dolly. And then we have Stable Diffusion. And Stable Diffusion is open source, which means you can download it. You can run it on a MacBook if you have a fast enough one, and it doesn't even need an internet connection. You can have it generate images off of a locally hosted library of visual um, inputs. We'll get to that in a little bit. And because Stable Diffusion is open source, it's kind of become the most powerful one of these over the last year. Um, all of them run on what are called prompts, which are kind of like metadata, but you're 
feeding into the machine to get it to generate images in the exact way you want it to. And these prompts can get pretty granular. This is a website called PromptBase. I interviewed the creator uh, earlier last year, and you buy the prompts. You, you, I, bought, uh, I paid $2 to buy uh, a prompt that can generate an infinite amount of Pixar characters, and then I put it into Midjourney on Discord, and voila. Uh, as you can see, you can toggle the things that they're wearing, the colors, the aspect ratio. This generates an 8K HD realistic format. You, the sky's the limit, and you know, to get something like this, you kind of have to iterate thousands and thousands and thousands of times, so to buy a prompt is pretty easy. Although I should point out, this one I didn't notice until recently, also has the tag trending on ArtStation. ArtStation is a popular platform for uh, digital art, and it's literally just crawling the trending page for inputs, which is not good. Um, so we also have Runway, which is a video AI generator. It's kind of like Final Cut Pro or Premiere, but with a bunch of souped up AI capabilities. And we also have Eleven Labs, which can create artificial voices, and it can also clone voices based on 30 to 40 seconds of sample audio. I've messed around with this. I, I made a pretty good Joe Biden clone, um, as you can see there. And uh, I needed about 45 seconds, and the audio had to be super clean, no background noise, or the background noise get pulled into the synthesis, and it starts to sound really crazy. We also have digital clones. Uh, these are uh, complicated. So we have Delphi, and we have the more popular Replica. And Replica has had some issues because its users keep, um, how do I put this, uh, uh, having sex with it, basically. Uh, and they keep trying to change the terms of service to make it so people can't. But that has created an arms race for what's called jailbreaking it. So if you've ever heard the term jailbreaking an AI, what you're really doing is kind of a version of a prompt injection. You're trying to convince the AI to go against its programming. And it turns out it's pretty simple. And a very popular use case for jailbreaking is using it as a therapist. <laughs> Hoo boy. Uh, I actually interviewed a real life therapist about this though, and he was much more positive about it than ChatGPT was. So Dr. Finian Fallon said to me that a focus on AI will let us discover how important the relationship in therapy really is and whether people need other people to heal. Meanwhile, ChatGPT says it is unlikely that an AI can fully replace human therapists. Uh, and I think, honestly, both are correct. Like, it's not a very good replacement, but if you read the Reddit quotes about how to jailbreak an AI to use it as a romantic partner or a therapist or any sort of emotional connection, most people are doing it as a way to practice uh, expressing themselves to work through feelings before they work them through with real humans, at least for now. So it's, it's not super troubling. Um, my favorite sort of general summary, though, of where we are right now with this technology is from the New Yorker's Kyle Chaika, who writes, I'll say again what I will doubtless be saying a million times in the coming years. Algorithmic feeds have pushed content creators to conform to the acceptable aesthetic and cultural average AI generation will just automatically produce that average from the start. So we've basically built these machines that can generate 25 years worth of internet content. Now we can use those to build new content, theoretically. In terms of what these things can actually produce, though, there are still some limitations. And I think a really good way to look at this is to look at what visual AI can generate. So if you're wondering, if you're looking at an AI-generated image, there are some giveaways. The biggest one is the prevalence of orange and blue. The theory is that because these are trained on so many movie posters, they can't help but put blue and orange. Of course, you know, when your subject is blue and orange, it, it, it just tends to do that. But you also have some other tells. So for instance, uh, I found him earlier. There's one of these cops, oh yeah, he's right there, has, th has three fingers right there. A lot of the faces don't really render. And the other thing to keep in mind is that usually the subject is center focus. So obviously this prompt was Donald Trump gets arrested in Manhattan. And so everything in the center focus is rendered pretty well. But the further out you get, that's where the AI just gets kind of lazy and gives up. Chances are you've all probably seen this guy. Round of applause. Have you seen Balenciaga Pope? Yeah. So this is, uh, this is, for those who haven't, this is a, an AI generation of the Pope wearing a Balenciaga parka. What you might not know is that the guy who generated it was high on magic mushrooms, uh, which is actually pretty cool. He was hallucinating, and then he decided to make a machine hallucinate. I think that's really beautiful, actually. My favorite sort of general meme, though, when it comes to AI, is this one from Tumblr in 2022. 
So some Tumblr users who were fans of the band My Chemical Romance thought it would be funny to create a fake My Chemical Romance song called Volcano Shake 'em Up. And then they used ChatGPT to generate the lyrics and then started covering it and hiding it around YouTube and convincing people that it was real. And I think this is actually a really good model for how these technologies will probably start to work with users. They're going to use them as sort of this intermediary to do you know, tasks that they don't want to or to inject a little chaos into it. We've also got experiments like Watch Me Forever, which is the Twitch channel that was streaming 24-7 episodes of Seinfeld, all generated by an AI. The problem was they weren't using a very good language model, and it went rogue and just got stuck on a transphobic loop and then was taken off of Twitch. It is not the only Twitch stream to have this problem because there was an AI-generated Family Guy stream that was using uh, a 3D modeling engine like Unreal or Unity to do the same thing, and it became super offensive and was also taken down. So you really have to watch these things because they, they don't have thoughts, they don't have morality, they, don't have any, they just sort of do whatever you tell them to, and there's really no parameters uh, to keep them in line unless you put them there. Uh, in terms of where we are with the whole visual uh, suite of AI, though, is probably best encapsulated by this video. So this is titled, Will Smith Eat Spaghetti? And this was generated totally by an AI. <laughs> so as you can see, uh, it, it doesn't really get hands very well. It doesn't really understand forks. Um, it, it has some issues, but pretty good. I think pretty good. There's some other experiments that people have been doing with this technology. So the YouTube channel Quarter Crew tried to get Midjourney to render a background from the Netflix show Sandman. Um, OK, so I'm going to ask you which one is which. So do you think the YouTube version, the AI version, is the top one? Round of applause. You guys are good. That's right. It's the bottom one. The bottom one was the YouTubers. Uh, they used a uh, green screen. They put a human in front of it. They used Midjourney. They then used After Effects to change it a little bit. Then they went a step further with a very viral video titled Rock, Paper, Scissors, Anime. Um, and what they did was they took frame by frame footage of them on a green screen, and then they uh, rotoscoped it. They covered it with an AI generation using the anime Vampire Hunter D from the 90s as source material, which got them in a lot of trouble because ethically that's not very cool. But the technology behind it and sort of what they were able to do is fairly impressive. Right. So as you can see, it's got some issues, but pretty, pretty impressive. So let's circle back to the audio AI, because this stuff is, is moving a little bit faster. And musicians have been sampling and playing with different synthesis for years, so it's a little more natural in that world. So we have Eleven Labs, which I mentioned earlier. We also have Uberduck. Chances are, if you ever come across uh, an AI-generated song, like say, like fake Kanye West or fake The Weeknd or whatever, it's usually coming from Uberduck, which is a little more sophisticated in terms of musicality, whereas Eleven Labs is kind of really only used for dialogue. The most viral video of all of these things being put together um, is probably Harry Potter Balenciaga. Pretty good. <laughs> yeah. So, so I get asked this question a lot, uh, which is why Balenciaga? <laughs> um, and I think it's really interesting how that ended up happening. For months and months, YouTubers were playing around with a prompt uh, that they had figured out that Midjourney is particularly good at, which is 80s dark fantasy. So you started to see all these YouTubers making things that looked like they were from Labyrinth or Dune or something. And they slowly realized that Balenciaga just kind of looks like something that someone would wear in a weird 80s sci-fi movie. And so what they were doing was not so much going for Balenciaga as a prompt, and you can see it in that last video. 
they kind of look like they came out of Dune. You know, they, it looks very gothic and very 80s. Um, and it sort of stuck as a meme. And then, of course, more people started playing around with it. And now it's, you, you can find one for almost every fashion trend that exists. Um, in terms of AI music, uh, we've got Ghostwriter977, which was a TikTok user who uh, was creating AI versions of Drake. Uh, interestingly enough, the Grammys actually ruled this week that an AI can be included in the Grammys, but it has to be written by a human being. We also have AIsis, which is really hard to say out loud because it sounds like something else, but it's AI Oasis. And the story behind this is really fascinating. It's a Oasis cover band that was like not doing very well. They wanted to release their own music. No one really cared. So they took their songs, replaced their singer with AI models of the Gallagher brothers, and produced this. Yeah, I would say it's about as good as the same thing, a uh, real thing. Uh, so we also uh, are seeing some more professional use cases for this. Uh, this is a stock photo that a Reddit user got on the, in the top left there. They then uh, went through uh, hundreds of iterations to do what's called in-painting, which is you, you find a, a section of the image and you start replacing it piece by piece with AI until it looks good. Uh, we also have this uh, example from the Stable Diffusion subreddit, which I think is really impressive. So this is a stock video of a guy working at his desk which was then in-painted by Stable Diffusion. Um, so as you can see, it has the same general framing and makeup of the original, but uh, totally new aesthetic and style. People have also used this to do their own de-aging. So this is a scene from Cowboys and Aliens, and it is a de-aged Harrison Ford. Although if you watch, as it goes deeper into this, you do see the oranges and blues again. So it, it is something you, you kind of have to watch when you're using this technology. It is kind of a dead giveaway. Now, obviously, when we're talking about user-generated content and what, the way people are experimenting with this, we, we sort of have to talk about uh, pornography. So uh, there is a Discord server called Unstable Diffusion. It runs on Stable Diffusion, uh, which is the only uh, AI generator that allows not safe for work content. And a lot of the proponents of this are sort of talking about this as this huge victory, which is very bizarre. And a, a couple months ago, I interviewed uh, a very popular OnlyFans model, you know, asking her about her thoughts about this. And I, I thought they were very prescient, which was uh, Laura Lux told me, there's been a real sort of avalanche of men implying that they don't need sex workers anymore because pretty soon they'll be able to AI generate a porn video of the hot girl that serves them their coffee every day. I think the only way that could fix it would be global regulation, and that's never going to happen. And I think that's right. I mean, it, obviously, we can all sit around and come up with like really incredible reasons for using an AI porn bot. But we're already seeing how this can be weaponized against average people, because there are no regulations against it. Other than copyright, you can pretty much do whatever you want with it. And the thing is, the Pandora's box is already open. Stable Diffusion, as I said, can run on a laptop without the internet. You can download it right now. So you can't really get rid of it. It's, it's part of our lives now. And it's making things very complicated. Um, it's also producing, you know, some pretty decent art, uh, sort of. Uh, it's, it's being used in different ways that are kind of interesting. This is an album cover from the rapper Lil Yachty. Uh, Ryan Reynolds used it to write a Mint Mobile ad, which was sort of kind of funny. Um, this was interesting. This was an animated short from Netflix where they took background images, fed them into an AI generator, fed it into another AI generator, and then revised it by hand. And then, of course, you have the opening credits to Marvel's Secret Invasion, which everyone got very mad about. But as someone who watched the show, let me tell you, this was the least bad thing about it. Um, and what they, the studio did was they took their original artwork, fed it into Stable Diffusion, and then had Stable Diffusion spit out something that looked otherworldly or inhuman or alien to fit the theme of the show. I think it's fine. I mean, the problem is that it looks like everything else that uses AI because these tools are kind of limited right now. We also saw experiments like Hustle GPT, which was a guy who put $100 into ChatGPT and asked it to make as much money as possible. The AI uh, did not do so well. Um, it, it, it didn't make much money. Uh, the AI's idea was to create like um, content farms and flood search terms. I'm sure if it had talked to any people in this room right now, it would have done a lot better. The AI kind of ran out of juice really fast, and, and that was the end of the experiment. Um, and that kind of takes us to where we are now with, with AI and search. And this is kind of where I want to end on, because things are moving really fast, and we're at this point, which we haven't really been at with the internet in a long time, where we don't really know what's going to win here. 
The, the major companies like Microsoft and Google and Meta and Apple are all in an arms race to bring AI into our lives. They're trying to find ways to get us to use it. And that's to say nothing of apps like TikTok, which also run on machine learning. This stuff is coming into our lives and it's affecting the way we view reality and get information. And we don't know if it's going to catch on. We don't know if this is a big bust like crypto or if this is, or the metaverse. Like we don't really know yet. So I'm trying to keep an open mind. I'm trying to remain skeptical, but figure out if this stuff has a place in my life and in, in my own work. And at the same time, search engines are slowly testing the waters with whether or not this is, a re if not a replacement for search, some way to augment it. And that's a little nerve wracking because for the last 25 years, we've essentially all been competing for about 10 spots on a page underneath a search result. And those 10 spots are slowly being compressed into three or sometimes two with more, uh, with a sub-menu, citations. And we have no idea if people are ever going to click those. We have no idea if this information is accurate, really. We don't really know how this will interact with what we're searching. But these big companies are trying this stuff. And if the rise of social in the 2010s is any example to base this off of, there will be a moment where if this stuff is going to work and going to be part of our lives, there's going to be a moment where something happens and the world's different. And we're in this very early stage where we're not sure if that's going to be true or not. So the way that I've sort of been navigating this is by saying to myself, I should understand how these things work. I should understand how people are using them, understand why people aren't using them, and try to figure out if there's any use to this. Do I think there is? I think a little bit. But for now, I don't think AI and search are a great fit. I actually think they're possibly completely competing ideas. And it's weird that we're sort of trying to cram AI into search. But at least for the foreseeable future, <laughs> this is what we're going to be dealing with. Um, I want to thank you all for listening to me ramble on about memes and technology. Uh, I'm speaking tonight at the Meme of the Moment down the street at Comedia. Please come by. It'll be really fun. It's like this, but with more beer, hopefully. Uh, my name is Ryan Broderick. Read my newsletter, Garbage Day. Thank you very much. Monthly reporting making you want to shove sharp things up your nose? Try Dragon Metrics, the all-in-one SEO software with mind-blowing reporting tools. 